Hello, everybody. I hope you all can hear me. Um, welcome to COFEM's Knowledge Summit, session number three, Feminist Movement Building. Let's go to the first slide. So a quick intro to the facilitators. Uh, my name is Lena Abarafi. I am the director of the Institute for Women's Studies in the Arab World, based at the Lebanese American University. Um, and I'm going to allow my co-facilitators to introduce themselves very quickly um, before we get into uh, the structure of today's session. Thank you, Lena. Um, hi, everybody. I am Liesl Lutz, and I'm based in South Africa. I currently work as a program officer in capacity building for the regional SRHR fund, which is um, an initiative that is um, consists of Ford Foundation, HIVOST, and also recently SIDA. And we do work on adolescent and youth sexual and reproductive health violence against young girls. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Mufida Haidar. I work as a gender integration specialist at the Institute for Women Studies in the Arab World in Lebanon. And thank you for joining us today. Okay, thank you both. Um, we've got a lot to cover. So here's what I'm going to say about uh, ground rules or suggested guidance for how to proceed. Um, for all of you who are here, please tell us what brought you here today in the chat box. I hope you can see the chat box. I actually can't but I trust that you all can. Um, and tell us your name, tell us what your interest is in the topic, tell us what you want to know. Um, and so while you're typing that right now, I'll take you through the format of the presentation. I hope you're typing. I can't see it, but I believe that you are. Anyway, our presentation today will be followed by a Q&A session at the very end. Um, but if you've got questions during the presentations, type it in the chat box straight away. And we've got somebody who is monitoring it. That's our colleague, Lauren. And we'll answer these at the end. Um, during the Q&A, use the raise hand function that's on Zoom with a little hand. Uh, if you want to use your microphone um, for that, raise your hand and then we'll unmute you because right now you all are on mute, I think, except for me. Um, if you can't find the raise hand function, uh, type it in the chat box and tell us you want to use the mic and then we will unmute you. Um, so we're, we're in control of your voice today. <laughs> If you prefer not to use it, don't worry about it. Just type in the question or comment or your thought, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. Um, let's go to the next slide about who COFEM is. Who is COFEM? Actually, who is COFEM? COFEM is the Coalition of Feminists for Social Change. Um, important word, feminists, in the middle. Um, it includes 150 activists, more than 150 um, activists and academics, practitioners, and everybody working around the world to address and end violence against women and girls. Uh, there's a website. You can see it on your screen. Um, this is, COFEM is an initiative that's hosted by Raising Voices and NOVO, the NOVO Foundation. Um, and it was started in New York in 2016, basically in response to the declining feminist perspective that we saw in humanitarian and development work on violence against women and girls. So among those who attended that initial meeting, it was decided that they would formalize the network to begin to address those kinds of concerns. So we started in response uh, to a backlash in effect. Um, and we were formally created in 2017 as a membership network. Uh, our key strength as COFEM lies in collective expertise and experience of members. So we're really as strong as our members and expanding all the time. And these members have, have made significant contributions to advancing women's rights and ending violence against women in humanitarian and development settings worldwide. So why is COFEM needed? I think you all are on this call um, precisely because you believe that it's needed. Um, this is uh, because of the critical work that's been done by women's movements worldwide. Uh, we've made a lot of progress, but um, we're here to talk about a backlash and we know that there is one and we've seen it specifically over the last decade and even more so amplified over the last few years. Um, so feminist informed violence against women and girls work is shrinking uh, and the gains that we have made are not secure and we cannot uh, be comfortable and take anything for granted at this stage. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so what we are trying to do is infuse a feminist perspective. Uh, we're trying to reclaim space 
uh, focus on women-centered, women-led, and rights-driven work in humanitarian and development settings, remembering that this is why we started in the first place. Uh, we need to make sure we have a strong feminist analysis that underpins everything that we do, and that includes how to better include men and boys in our efforts to end violence against women and girls so they remain accountable to women and girls because ultimately that's the point of our work and that's why we started in the first place. We work at the levels of theory and programming and we link gender inequality and violence against women and girls, um, which underlies that violence in the first place. Uh, we work with specialists across different sectors and we ensure that initiatives address different forms of violence, but we don't create victimhood competition. So it's none of this whataboutery uh, that we see happening so often. Uh, advocacy and uh, learning and advocacy tools. Thank you so much. We've got our feminist pocketbook and our SVRI paper and video series. So COFEM has developed these learning and advocacy tools for anyone and everyone working on preventing and responding to violence against women and girls. So check out the latest publication, which is the pocketbook that's on the website. Uh, you've got the link right there. And what we are talking about today builds from the tip sheets number nine and number 10, and our work on the SVRI paper and video series uh, that have been a collaborative effort, um, very thorough and uh, research-based and built on evidence. Um, the Knowledge Summit, next slide. Uh, so the COFEM Knowledge Summit, is what we're in the middle of right now. It's an online learning event. We know we're right now at the, in the early days of the 16 days of activism that started on the 25th of November, um, which is the International Day to Eliminate Violence Against Women and ends on the 10th of December, which is International Human Rights Day, also encompasses World AIDS Day on December 1st. So we've gone through several topics. This is topic three, feminist movement building. Topic four is on Monday. The dial-in link for all of these is the same. We encourage you to join. Um, these six sessions are led by different COFEM members on all of these topics, on the, the stuff that's in the Feminist Pocketbook, and they're open to anyone and everyone, and they're all conducted on Zoom, where we all happen to be right now. Um, and where are we? To register for other sessions. All right, you saw that information. Okay. Let's move on to feminist movement building, and I'm going to hand over to my lovely co-facilitator, Liesl, to talk about, uh, to give us the founding of this topic. Thanks, Lena. And um, just to say thank you again to all the participants for making the time to attend this Knowledge Summit. Like Lena said, we've had two brilliant sessions before ours, and um, the recordings for all of those sessions will be made available on the COFIM website at some point. Um, I think they are being loaded as we go. Um, so I'd like to just, um, if you can just move the slide for me to the next one. Just give some more background on the Feminist Pocketbook series recently launched by COFEM. And this is a series, like Lena said, of 10 short tip sheets. Mm -hmm. And they were designed for people working in humanitarian and development settings to have an accessible and easily digestible resource on feminist approaches in addressing violence against women and girls. So feminist movement building, which I'll be presenting on now is Fitchy 10. And it looks at feminist and women's movements for political and transformational change to end GBV and to achieve women's equality. It offers useful tips on creating and sustaining feminist movements, and you can also find these along with the rest of the series on the um, COFIN website. Okay, next. So I just want to start off the presentation um, and run through the definition of what a movement is. So a movement is defined as an organized set of constituents pursuing a common political agenda of change through collective action. Movements challenge and change the distribution and use of power. It is inherently political and it consists of politicized members, individuals and organizations who understand that injustice exists in many forms and impacts on different people's lives in many different ways. If you have attended the first session on feminist perspectives, you would have heard Anu Pele speak of vibrant women's movements present in almost all settings. Sorry, can you hear me? 
My mic. Okay, I'm going to try and just close the mic. So Anu has spoken about um, Nepal and women's movements challenging not only culture, but also humanitarian programming, overriding human rights by perpetuating harmful cultural practices, such as rebuilding of isolation groups for menstruating women. So next, please. So what is currently happening? Women's movements have long been at the forefront of pushing women's rights and bringing GBV into the public domain. Space for local women's movements to lead these efforts, however, is shrinking. We see mainstream development and humanitarian organizations increasingly leading work on GBV, and this is problematic, as most of these institutions lack local knowledge and political analysis of gender equality and gender-based violence. It is extremely important, then, that we maintain a political agenda in our efforts to address GBV and gender equality. Shrinking spaces means that there's a dilution of political and transformational dimensions, and we need to ensure that this does not happen. Next, please. So this slide, yeah, you can just, um, you can just get them all up there for me. Thank you. This slide has directly been taken, taken from the A with YFA presentation done in 2011. Now, from this graphic, we can see that movements have the power to change and influence at individual, community, and systemic levels in both formal and informal domains. So let's take a closer look. Advocacy and lobbying only have influence on the formal domain, access to resources and policy, it cannot change culture, and it cannot change individual values and beliefs. Now, this is where movements have its impact. It has the power to influence on a deeply personal level, as well as in our communities and culture. Next. So what makes movements succeed? Feminist movements and networks have the power to strengthen individuals and grassroots women's organizations. But to build strong movements, we also need strong women's organizations. So we need to have a common aligned goal where there's a clear definition of the goal, consensus thereof, and how this should be addressed. Movements needs, need a compelling position portraying the issue to inspire action at multiple levels. Movements need to be grounded in, in local knowledge, led by feminist women, and they have to share their knowledge. We have to be capable to forge strong alliances across all sectors and also lead in efforts to set the policy agenda. So in tip sheet 10, when you download it, you'll see there's a case study on Mama Cash and how they enable their grantees to identify their own priorities around GBV and how they resource them to use innovative and non-traditional methods and mechanisms to achieve their goals. So what this means is that movements need to be funded at a local and a national level and needs to be at the forefront of research, programming and decision making. Thank you, next. So this is just a quote slide looking at um, the drive for progressive policy and change. And what it basically just say is movements are contagious. If you look at the all women and me too. And movements shape the landscapes they join. And also funding for women often emerge from the movements that they serve. And Mama Cash is a very good ex example of this. Next, please. So there's another critical part to the success of feminist movements and networks and the ability to support women at grassroots. This is the multi-generational aspect in, in movement building. Here I want to give an example of a young female-led organization in Kehansha, Kenya. And I'm grateful for their input into the slide and their permission to use them as a case study. So as I said, Kumsi Chana, that's their name, is a young female-led organization all below the age of 30. And they work with young women and girls um, on preventing female genital mutilation. So they find themselves in a very isolated area. When I met them, they only belonged to one network. And although there's a vibrant women's movement in Kenya, 
and many activities taking place in the urban areas. For them, it was challenging to get out and to be present in spaces where they would be able to make their voices heard. So here's what they identified as what they need and, you know, to be able to be supported and um, what they would need from movements and networks around them. So the first is the isolation issue, not being able to access global spaces that limits the ability to participate in movements. So much change um, often happens at the village level, driven by young women and not highlighted or amplified at a, at a global level. So this often goes unseen. They were also talking about capacity building and a need for such. And this is not necessarily just for organizations, sorry people, but also for informal groups. And this is often a problem for donors, as we know they do due diligence, and um, they need more formal structures. So capacitating informal groups is not always possible. So what, what women need, and especially young women, is more flexible funding to be able to look at these things. Next, please. So why is multi-generationality important? In order to mobilize young women, we need young leaders. Young women and young leaders can help keep movements accountable and they can help them to survive. So it is a survival tactic as well. So it is really important to be inclusive of young women and leadership depth must include them in order to grow and impact. Right, next please. So how do we create strong movements and how do we sustain them? And through this process, how can we support women's organizations? Now, developing women's organizations is essential in movement building. The current funding landscape is largely inadequate in responding to the needs of movements to advance women's rights. More specifically, and this is something that needs far more rocking the boat, and this is how donor part and this is how donors partner and make funding decisions when it comes to women's rights and women's rights organizations to lead such efforts. Funders increasingly implement strict control frameworks, excluding women's organizations and movements, and there's a lack of long-term investment and providing more substantial funds. And if you go to the previous session that we've had, um, they also, I think my connection might be a little bit, might be quite weak. So I'm very sorry, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, we as feminist movement builders need to hold donors accountable and donors need to become more strategic in how they partner with women. A would also mentioned a couple of years back that we need a funding, the funding landscape needs to change and it, changed, it needs to change to become a funding ecosystem which is connected, coherent, complementary for women and women's rights work. Strengthening capacity is also a really important factor in sustaining women's networks. Sorry, I'm just gonna move a little bit. There's a historic focus on programmatic work, especially from donors. Developing women's organizations will be essential then in building movements. So how do we ensure that organizations that are weak in structures and in their compliance, for example, uh, organizations that might not be registered for tax or might not be tax compliant. So how can we help strengthen them? Um, as donors generally turn these types of organizations away. Evelyn and Tina also in the last session mentioned that um, women often work for free. They are often charitable in their organizations. And um, we see that all too often in Southern and Eastern Africa as well. There are a few formal systems in place when it comes to women's organizations and organizations get penalized by donors because of this. So we need to help women diversify funding and look beyond grants to really establish strong relationships with donors. We need to find ways in our movements, in our organizations, our networks to create a dedicated capacity building support to enable a vibrant and sustainable civil society led by women.
<laughs> we also need to strengthen partnerships and networks. We need to look at what they look like, how they are supporting women. We need to have a bi-directional transfer of knowledge and skills. We need to pay attention to intersectionality. We need to focus on our common cause. We need to have self-care in place and compassion. And we also need some mechanisms in place to deal with backlash. And this is where I will introduce Lena to you, who will now speak about backlash and what it is and how we can address it safely in the Arab world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liesl. I hope you all can hear me. Um, so I'll be talking about the, what the backlash is and how we can address it safely. Um, in effect, a backlash is is how we know we're we're pushing the right boundaries and how we're working. It seems to be um, a part of our work, a, a constant. And that's why for the Feminist Pocketbook, we created tip sheet number nine on the backlash specifically and how to manage it and how to address it safely. So this tip sheet provides practical tips so we all can identify and understand and address this backlash and negotiate the resistance that we seem to inevitably experience when we work on gender equality. Uh, and the tip sheet is useful because it also highlights the strategies um, so we can do some advanced thinking, preparing for a backlash, uh, knowing that it is coming and managing it more effectively at different levels, uh, protecting the, the people that we work for and with and protecting ourselves as well. Um, next slide, please. So what is it? Um, it's pushback. It's from individuals. It's from systems. It's from institutions that benefit from what is the patriarchal status quo, which is an unfortunate global reality. Um, so this is something that we have to constantly negotiate. And it includes implicit or explicit attempts to block activism uh, or programming or our, our, our voice, our, our words, our efforts, our energies, anything that we try and do to advance uh, equality and to end violence against women and girls. Um, and it shows that our work is actually having an impact and gaining credibility and, and acceptance. You push those boundaries and it's, it's always a dance of one step forward and two steps back. So it's something that we just need to deal with and, and manage more effectively if we're going to make change and sustain gains. Uh, next slide, please. So the goal is to put us, to put feminists, to put the movement uh, back in our place, so to speak, um, because this is a threat to the patriarchal status quo. So what would that entail? Uh, verbal harassment, physical abuse, sexual abuse, online abuse, which is becoming extremely problematic and increasingly violent, um, and also uh, go, tends to go offline as well. Um, and subtle or hidden forms of resistance that buttress patriarchal systems and institutions. So um, we need to look at this. Oh, next slide, sorry. We need to look at backlash. Oh, next slide. There we go. On a spectrum, going from denial to outright backlash and the idea that, you know, those feminists deserve all the abuse that they get. Um, so this spectrum... Uh, is quite thorough and has uh, been adapted from others and is a part of the tip sheet and is something that we should all um, uh, understand because uh, it helps us to negotiate the different phases and where we're at and then how to, um, how to better arm ourselves and prepare. Um, one of the things that we're hearing quite a bit of is uh, number six, which is what about men? What about her? Men are victims, men too. What about men? So this is something that uh, I think we've all been working towards. We've all been, uh, we've all experienced and something that we are working on strategies to combat um, because it's becoming an inevitable part of our daily work um, as we continue to push boundaries. Um, and we can talk about that. I'd be interested in people's comments and thoughts. And don't forget, the chat box is open. So ask questions so we can address them during the Q&A at the end of the session so you don't keep us talking the entire time. Um, <laughs> so next slide. Key strategies. 
there we go. So framing, um, articulating, communicating, framing the issue, and then explaining why it's important. These are strategies to address the backlash. Uh, there are organizational strategies as well, messages that are clear on how to involve leaders, uh, individuals, groups, organizations, uh, advocating for organizational policies, practices, and structures that support individuals and support groups who speak out. Um, we don't want people fearing uh, speaking out. We want people to use the voice that they have. We keep saying that everybody has a voice, but not everybody has a microphone. And we want to make sure that people feel like they are uh, able to speak and protected when they, when they do. Um, Community-based strategies as well to address the backlash include things like building solidarity and alliances with other feminist organizations uh, and networks uh, that can facilitate the dealing with incidents of backlash. Plan for anticipated backlash, right? Anticipate it before it occurs so you know how you're going to address it. Um, and there are teaching and learning strategies um, that increase awareness about and engagement with issues of gender equality. And these are effective in minimizing backlash and they create a supportive space for discussion. And finally, Liesl did a great job of mentioning this, but it's worth stating again, self-care. Uh, if we don't look after ourselves, we're not going to be enough uh, of a support for other people. Um, and as we work as advocates and activists and, and feminists uh, on the street and in our homes and in whatever spaces we occupy, raising our voices, we still have to make sure that we are protected. Um, so identify allies, um, communities of practice, support groups, uh, strategies that work for you, whatever that is, to prioritize self-care uh, and make sure that we focus efforts on things that we can influence. I mean, this is a, a difficult battle and we have to be in it for the long haul. Um, I don't see a lot of uh, instant victories and quick gains. So we really have to brace ourselves. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we talk about the Arab world, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague and expert, to Mufida, to tell us what's going on in this region because we are experiencing a rather egregious backlash. Uh, Mufida, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Uh, so I think we're going to play the vid small video first, and then we're going to talk about the Arab context and feminists in the Arab world. In Tunis, women were in the front line demanding the downfall of the dictatorship. And then a few months later, the election of the Islamist party in Nada was to once again have thousands of them in the streets. In Cairo, during the Egyptian revolution, the women are also there. But during the demonstrations against the ruling power, they are the target of systematic attacks and sexual assaults. While the people of the Arab world rise up in the name of freedom, the rights and status of women unleash vehemence and political clashes more than ever. And yet, 50 years ago, women's freedom and emancipation already seemed a sure destiny for Arab women. While their country became independent, some women, such as Egyptian actresses and dancers, proudly showed off their free and sensual bodies. And the political leaders of the time, the liberators of the people, declared they also wanted to liberate women. Fifty years on, however, Arab women are having to fight more than ever to conquer or defend the rights they so dearly acquired and their condition has not improved, at least very little. What happened? How will Arab women manage to shake up these societies so closed by sexism and the patriarchy? This film recounts their struggle and their history.
thank you for this. So as you can see that from the video, that Arab women have played a major role in uh, the Arab Spring. They were the first to start the Libyan Revolution, and their movement had a great impact of course, uh, also in Tunisia, uh, especially in terms of rights. So recently, like in Tunisia, Muslim women uh, gained the right to marry a non-Muslim man, which is usually like most in Arab countries, especially in Lebanon, this doesn't exist, because in Lebanon we have 18 different sects, so 18 different person status laws, and Muslim women um, if they're following the laws, cannot marry a non-Muslim man. Uh, also, however, women face a lot of violence during the revolutions, especially in Egypt, sexual violence and sexual harassment in specific. Moreover, as stigma still exists, and due to the pushbacks from the society, a lot of women still prefer to avoid engaging in movements and activism out of fear or respect to their families and the society. Uh, and here I would like to also point uh, to share is, um, a very recent example from Lebanon about a young woman called Manal Asi. So Manal Asi was beaten to death by her husband in front of her kids four years ago. And yet two days ago, a very well-known TV station in Lebanon gave the, her husband the opportunity to justify his acts from prison for 50 minutes without hearing the other side. And this happened uh, in uh, and 16 days of activism, which is a huge thing, and giving the opportunity to uh, to the husband to justify himself. So I think that's it. And now we're going to go to Q and A, and we can uh, please send your questions to the chat box, please. Hi, Lena and Liesl and Mufida, thanks for a really informative presentation today. To start off this Q&A session, I would just like to ask all participants to either send along your questions in the chat box if you'd like, or you can also unmute yourselves on Zoom to ask questions yourself during this Q&A session. So we can move along with that now. Hi, thank you so much for that great presentation, uh, Lena, Lizzle, and Mufida. I actually have a question, um, and it's related to young feminists in the movement. Um, I just wanted to know what sort of, you know, practical tips that you have for younger feminists who are, you know, um, taking the first step in going out there and really being vocal about um, their rights and, you know, fighting patriarchy, especially in contexts where they receive very little to no parental support or support from their communities. I think it would be very interesting to know um, your take on that, both in the Arab context as well as um, in other parts of the world. And if other participants have any other uh, tips to share, I would be very um, interested in hearing them. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, this is Lena. Uh, I'll answer just from the perspective of the region and what we've been doing and also pass on to Mufida, who does a lot of work with young activists. Uh, so I think the challenge is, first of all, feeling like uh, we need to counter what is um, a sense of apathy. Uh, which is really challenging and the idea that uh, no matter what we do and no matter how many protests and how many issues we tackle it doesn't seem to have the kind of effect that we want so I think uh, there is a sense that this is futile that that young people are, are discouraged to a certain extent um, there is there are some movements and I think the idea is first of all to bring these movements together to help them see the commonalities these the interconnections we talk a lot about intersectionality and that's really important um, especially in this region well everywhere but really the idea that they're not alone that uh, it takes a long time there's no quick fix um, and they really need to be in it for the long haul as I said earlier but also that there are strategies and there are techniques so it's not just about being angry but about how you channel that anger and where you where you put your energy and how to not be discouraged how to keep going and how to keep fighting and to tackle it from many different levels all at once you know this is I think this is this is a full-time job and yet we all have jobs outside of this uh, so it becomes rather challenging for young people but what we do at least in the context of the university is find creative ways to put people together I'll have Mufida talk about some of the ways that we uh, through the 16 days of activism for instance have done um, competitions and other fun things but we work with student clubs like the feminist club and the human rights club and all of that stuff 
to try and uh, encourage them to try and give them some of the techniques, give them some of the support, create these informal communities of practice around these issues so that they can keep going. Also see the interconnections between uh, other human rights issues, look at other, you know, working with other universities in Lebanon, looking at things from a regional perspective, connecting with global guidance and good practice and the global movements that we can learn from. So it, it's a lot of information. Um, and then making sure that we bring that back to the region and, and make it relevant and, and meaningful and contextual for young people who are here. Uh, but I think Mofida can tell us about some of the fun things that we do, um, like our video and art competition and song and, and other things that have really galvanized a lot of young people and uh, given them a sense of um, connection to the movement. Thank you, Lena, for this. Well, uh, the very main thing that we are actually doing is uh, using art for activism. And actually, this is the third year in a row, and even more, because also on International Women's Day, we did uh, an art competition. And now, part of 16 Days of Activism, we have this art competition that targets uh, all youth under 25 years old from all the Arab region, not only for Lebanon. And it also has specific uh, category for ch uh, children under uh, 10 years old. Uh, so they are the ambassadors, ambassadors of change after all and I would like to give a great example for the winner of the 2016 art competition uh, he was uh, he's an LEU student he's a film student at LEU and um, this was actually given as part of an assignment so he didn't have any like gender related uh, um, info so he had to search for this and then he used his mother hand to do this short video and suddenly after that he became a gender activist at the university so using art was um, a very cool thing to engage a lot of youth and actually uh, do some change but also as dina said and uh, from my personal experience as well um the f like being part of the movement is really a full-time job and you have to remind yourself every single morning that uh, I'm gonna do it and this is not a job this is just my life and this is how I'm gonna be and this is who I am so either at home or when you're watching TV or working you just put on the gender lens at all as Dina says and you feel like I have to talk about this and like even if it's on the news or on in a movie or anything else you just feel like this became part of your everyday language uh, with your personal relations or and this is how you affect and this is how the ball just rolls on and gets bigger and bigger. All right, we have a few more questions in the chat box. The first one is um, an interest in knowing any practical ways that you can share and how to address men also having rights, you know, this message without diluting our feminist message. And along with this, how to support informal movements that would like to stay informal, um, even when you're working within an INGO that has a lot of modalities and procedures that might kill the activist spirit. So do you have any success stories to share about that as well? Hi, this is Lena again. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to actually take the last question um, and then we'll go back to the one on men. Um, what I see is uh, what about feminists from other countries and what can they do on women's rights in the Middle East? And can they have a role? Absolutely, they can. Um, and can you do that without imposing Western norms and ideals? Of course. Uh, the idea is to really listen to uh, local people and local contexts and let uh, local movements take the lead and that's um, that's absolutely possible and I think there's room for everyone and everyone is welcome and we all have a role and I mean I see a you know a global sisterhood without wanting to romanticize it too much but I really think that it's possible to do good work anywhere and everywhere as long as you're paying attention to what the people around you really want and where they're saying they need help um, we have at the Institute a ton of international uh, interns activists researchers whoever's um, all with feminist convictions and ready to put themselves to work and they just come and roll up their sleeves and do whatever is needed and whatever it takes. Um, just a, a, a story about my, my time in Afghanistan. I lived in Afghanistan for four years and I remember um, learning very quickly about you know this question that you've asked. Uh, from Afghans when I was um, also doing my doctoral research and I was interviewing women and men about what they thought of what was happening in Afghanistan and all the changes. And this was 2002 and three. So this is kind of the early days. 
And an Afghan man said to me, he said, um, the world thought they could bring freedom to Afghan women, but freedom is only one from the inside. And I never forgot that. And I thought, okay, I think I understand what he means, that there's still a role for somebody like me. I'm obviously not Afghan, um, but uh, it really is about what is happening on the insides, the movements, the momentum. I mean, there are feminist movements everywhere. And to say that feminism is a, you know, an import and an imposition is one of the greatest global myths that I have ever heard. So I would just want to say, yes, absolutely. And Alice, come into the office. You're in Beirut. We'd love to work with you. Um, you know, for the men one, okay, men also have rights. Oh man. I mean, um, this is also, this is tough, but we do, we have, we have men who are part of the team, men who are interns, uh, men who are allies and champions and, and supporters. And yes, you know, men also have rights, but they've also had them for a very long time. So um, I, you know, I don't know about practical ways. I might leave this to someone else. But, you know, we work with men and some of our, um, our strong supporters here are men. And I think there isn't any, uh, it's not a zero sum game as we keep saying. And that what aboutery I find to be the most frustrating and, and discouraging response ever. Uh, the reality is that globally, I mean, maybe with Iceland as the exception, um, I, we just are not living in a, a context where we've ever experienced full equality. So given that, I mean, yes, men have had the power for all of that time and look at what they've done with it. So, I mean, it's time for a new order as far as I can see. That's not practical. That's just honest and, you know, off the top of my head. Um, maybe Liesl's got some better strategies. <laughs> So Liesl is having some technical difficulties with her audio, so she's writing some answers into the chat box. So for those of you, if you can't see it, she says, hi all. So with informal movements, I'm sure Mufida can add more about working with young feminists, but having worked with a local group in Mombasa, I found that this is really hard to balance. There's often a feel of imposing and trying to change as INGOs and donors do have a lot of intensive procedures. Mufida, can you hear? Do you have anything else to add to this? Well, or Lena? Uh, oh, Lena's here. Okay. Whoops. I just unmuted. Um, well, what I can tell you is this. Yes, we do. I mean, our work is really focused on young feminists because this is uh, an academic institute that is uh, sitting under a university. So we've got a captive audience and they happen to be young. Um, we work with all ages though. But what we, I think what's important about that is, um, that what we do very often is have international partners and colleagues come to us and, and ask for guidance or orientation on where they can work and how they can be most effective and what they can do because we are a local partner. So we're more than happy to provide advice, input, share our networks, guide individuals and organizations who want to support to know where they can channel their energies. Um, so I think you know, for wherever you are and from wherever you sit, that's possible. So you can take your cue from the people who are already doing the work. Um, and that's something that we do constantly. Um, and anybody who wants more on that can definitely tell us. Um, Mofida, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, our work with young feminists is something that for me has been the most exciting and encouraging part. And to see young people, uh, both women and men, become um, accidental activists by virtue of some of the things that we do and some of the maybe more sneaky ways that we engage people uh, is for me one of the most interesting um, and encouraging um, changes that we have. So the idea is that generally, I mean, people tend to not know uh, the extent of inequalities or what's happened or the realities of, of the ba multiple backlashes that we face or what's going on in the country or in the region or what the uh, what rights they have or don't in the legis in legislation or you know, in uh, in society and religion and even in their homes and so when we talk about those kinds of things and we create a space to share information, provide factual information, um, bring people together to talk about these kinds of issues, um, people are really shocked. And we've, take, we've done some pretty controversial things. Um, as one example, I don't want to digress too much, but I will tell you that we did a training for the Miss Lebanon beauty pageant contestants. Those are young women, uh, not feminist, 
necessarily, but uh, people thought this was really something controversial and something we shouldn't have done, and we disagreed fundamentally, and we said everybody has a right to understand what their rights are um, and understand where the inequalities are and understand the implications of what they are doing when they participate in beauty pageants and they cater to a beauty industry that is a tool of the patriarchy uh, and that promotes violence in so many ways, um, that is damaging to women and to young girls specifically. So that was a real eye-opener. We had two days with these young women, and I think we gave birth to some feminists in that session. Did we radically change everybody? No, we didn't, but we have to start somewhere. And because we are extremely persistent, we are going to keep going. And Lebanon is one of those places where things like eating disorders, body image, whatever, are, um, uh, are big issues. We're a plastic surgery capital. We have just been dubbed by The Economist as a leader in uh, the quote-unquote designer vagina. I'm not even making this stuff up. The point is that we've got a lot of work to do in terms of birthing a feminist consciousness with women uh, in the country. So um, I think the idea also is to work with everybody and to not uh, discount certain groups or populations or opportunities because we think that they're not worthy of learning it. Actually, feminism is born, and feminists are born in places that might surprise us. Uh, so anyway, that's just one little anecdote that may be of interest. And Mufida's got some more. Yeah, thank you, Nina, for this. And I would like to add something that, uh, with my experience with young feminists and even young men here at the, um, in Lebanon, many of them are afraid to declare that they are feminists because they have a fear of this. And sometimes it's turning out into kind of a stigma. So they are with women's rights or they, they support women, but they never understand what does it mean to be a feminist. So it's really nice when you come to an, uh, a conversation with them and you actually bring them to declare with time that they are real feminists and they are actually willing to fight for it. But I think it really comes from the acceptance. So it's really important with uh, the young generation to accept whatever they say, understand whatever they say, and actually go into conversation and listen to them carefully. Thank you, Mufida. Um, I actually have a question, and, and I, I think I just, you know, what you just said, I mean, this hesitance to, and the reluctance to actually use the F word, I mean, to say that you're a feminist. Um, and it's really interesting because I've met so many people in the humanitarian and development space. Uh, people, you know, you would assume that, well, we are all humanitarians and we are working for the betterment of, you know, communities and people. Why is it so difficult for me to actually say I'm feminist? I mean, there's so much resistance when I advocate. I mean, I've heard from friends that when they advocate for a feminist informed approach, people are like, well, We'll, we can do gender, but we're not going to do feminism, you know? So there is this really weird um, depoliticization uh, going on. And that's really problematic because you are not going to achieve true gender equality if we don't, you know, if we don't consider this as a political movement. And yet a lot of the work that is being done or, you know, the pushback, really from our you know feels tends to come from this place where yes we can do gender but it needs to be this diluted and depoliticized approach to gender work um and so what is your advice and i and i would love to hear from participants on the call i mean if you face this in your work um how did you manage that i mean how did you respond to that I have a lot of friends who do not want to even write, you know, in their job applications that they believe in feminist principles because they think that the most important thing is to just get their foot in the door. Um, and then, you know, then they can sort of like subtly introduce uh, feminist work um, or, or rather feminist analysis into the work that they're doing. But there is so much reluctance to actually, um, you know, um, just say the word. Um, so yeah, I would I would love to hear uh, what others, you know, think about this, whether you've experienced this in your work, and if you could share some tips, uh, because it, it is it is really frustrating when you can't just say what you stand for and that you have to do this little dance. Um, and, I, I, and, I don't, and I don't think anybody else needs to hide their activism. 
uh, to the extent that some of you know us feminists need to do in certain spaces. Yeah, so I would love to hear what the facilitators have to say as well as the participants. Divi, I encourage you to keep sticking to your uh, beliefs and never stop doing that even if it's coming from the top to the bottom because many times many times when we really need to make a change we have to go from the bottom to the top and from the needs and from our beliefs because if we don't believe in what we're doing we can't make a real change uh and i'm not saying that just like words from a book i'm just saying that from a real life experience so um i think if all of us would keep um speaking the same language and s keep doing this um things would change with time so uh stick to it and maybe others would do that as well. This is Lena again. I think um, you guys want me to answer the question about the greatest barriers to girl and adolescent led groups and feminist movements. Oh my gosh, in the region. I mean, where do I start? How much time do we have? There are loads. Um, everything from you know, the sense that they, um, they, their voices won't make an impact to connecting with each other, to massive fear of backlash, to uh, laws and, and structures that are not in their favor, to education systems that promote um, uh, stereotypes and discrimination, to culture and, and religion, to the media that discriminates against women and objectifies women. Um, I mean, this is, you know, I think it's true for everywhere, right? I don't think these are particular challenges and barriers just in this region. How are they navigating those barriers? Um, with great difficulty. You know, it's interesting because right now we're working on an edited volume on young Arab women's feminist activism. So we're investigating what does that mean to them? Do they call themselves activists? Do they call themselves feminists? How are these movements born? Are they... Um, are they structured and formal? Are they feeding into local or international NGOs or, or, or other kind of traditional systems? Or are they just kind of fluid and independent and organic and um, naturally kind of intersectional? I think part of the challenge here is that the region has a very young population. And the few women that we see in power, you know, we don't have a lot of role models, right? So the older generation, if they are in power, older generation of women, um, they're not sharing those seats. They are, uh, they've claimed that space usually through rather traditional means, right? If you look at women who've gained access to senior levels of politics and leadership and decision making, they've done so either through family connections or through being the right sect or through uh, what we call like for women in parliament here in Lebanon, entering in black, meaning the widows of uh, dead politicians. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really not easy for women to gain those kinds of seats. And then when they do, they are not sending the elevator back down. As we say, they are not mentoring and supporting and nurturing young women leaders because they because those young women are already leaders in their own right. You know, this idea of like young women are future leaders. No, they are to, they are leaders already. Uh, it's just that the older generation, by and large, isn't really creating space for shared leadership. So with this book that we've been working on, we're trying to find what the trends are, what the generational gaps are, what, the, uh, what are the issues that they face? How do they organize? Um, do they want to be part of, oh yeah, the book sounds amazing. I know, if I just had time to write it, it would be great. Um, <laughs> it's all in my head right now. But what we're doing is actually talking to young women who are out there who are doing that work to see, you know, how do they how do they structure themselves? How do they connect with the movement? You know, the movements, how do they feel about it? Where do they go to get their energy? Where do they get their information? Uh, do they want to be part of formal, you know, do they want to join NGOs? No, they don't want to start NGOs and then register with the ministry and then be subjected to all of these, these rules and these, these blockages and these obligations and these structures. They want to, maintain their their freedom and flexibility and fluidity and i think that's really cool and that's coming up and that's starting and the fact ironically that we can find almost no literature on this in the region is in and of itself a finding because we know that these movements are there but we're trying to put together some of these trends to start thinking more critically about how we can support them so answers to those questions forthcoming uh watch the space 2019 Thank you so much, Lena. That is sound. The book sounds amazing. 
Uh, we have another question in the chat box that Lizzle, um, Lizzle has responded to, which is, how do we address the challenge of funding, especially for movement building? Most of the development partners would not even want to see the words violence against women, feminism, movements, patriarchy in any document. And she says, the funding challenge is real. I have read an article by Ellen Springer speaking about the before processes of building relationships with donors long before trying to apply for funds. So we need to start thinking beyond grants and think of relationship and relationship building. And in this way, it offers some entry points to start building an understanding of the issues, which is almost courting donors towards a more feminist understanding. And um, you know, we need strong allies and we need to leverage these relationships. Liesl, could you provide us the title of the article? Are you, do you know what it is? Okay, she's going to post the link in the chat box. Thank you. And right now we're coming towards the end of our session. This has been really great. And we'd like to ask all the participants to please provide anonymous feedback on this session in a short survey at the following link. It won't take much of your time and it would be really helpful for us. I can also post this in the chat box for your convenience. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at CoFem. You can see the link, I think, and check the website. And for any further info, please email us on info at cofemsocialchange.org. And thank you so much uh, for joining us again. Thank you so much to the facilitators and participants. And uh, just a very quick announcement. Our next session is scheduled next Monday at 12.30 p.m. GMT. Um, initially, it was scheduled on December 1st, on Saturday, but that has now been shifted. Uh, and that topic is on why GBB programming focuses on women and girls. It's going to be very exciting and fascinating. So please do join us. And yes, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>